Hello, and welcome to World of Warbirds. I'm Brian Pierce. In 1937, the German Ministry of Aviation issued a request for a short-range, three-seat reconnaissance aircraft to support the German army in the field. At the time, the newly released Henschel HS-126 was performing this duty as well as the liaison role. But the thinking was that two very specialized aircraft would better perform these two different roles. Liaison would be performed by the Fiesler FI-156 Storch, and the other new aircraft would pick up the recon duties. For the new recon aircraft, excellent all-round visibility was the supreme priority. Bolfaka Wolf and Arado were tapped to come up with designs. Initially, Arado's proposal, the AR-198, was considered more interesting. It was an all-metal, shoulder-winged, single-engine aircraft that used a BMW radial for power. It solved the visibility problem by having the pilot way up high in the front, giving a great view forward and a glazed dorsal area to look to the rear, although the tail fin would be in the way. For looking below, the AR-198 had a kind of glazed pod built into the belly. It's a little funny looking and does kind of look like the aircraft is about eight months pregnant. There was to be a crew of three, including the pilot and two observers, who could also act as gunners if needed. For armament, it had one fixed forward-firing MG-17 machine gun and two flexibly mounted MG-15s at the dorsal and ventral positions. It would also be able to carry four 110-pound bombs on underwing racks. Sounds pretty good, right? In March 1938, the prototype AR-198 took off on its maiden flight, and the results were mixed. It was reported that the test flight proved generally satisfactory, except for flight instability in all axes during low-speed flight. In response, Arado tinkered with the wing, added automatic slats to help out with the low-speed flight problem, but the prototype was still difficult to handle. When the point of the aircraft is to observe and report, you don't really want the pilot, who is one-third of the crew, to be so engaged with just keeping the machine airborne. So the Arado AR-198 project was terminated in late 1938. Meanwhile, over at Fuckewolf, Kurt Tank would solve the visibility request by making the crew compartment one big, very glazed pod with a stepless cockpit in the front leading back to a fully glazed tail cone in the rear. By the way, a stepless cockpit means there is no separate windshield for the pilot. Other examples are the B-29 or HE-111. To get the engines, props, and tail out of the way for the all-important visibility requirement, Tank chose two Argus AS-410 engines and placed them out on the wings connected to two twin booms that led to a twin tail. The Argus AS-410 was an air-cooled inverted V-12 engine and was the bigger brother to the engine used in the FI Storch. For weapons, the 198 had two forward-firing MG-17 machine guns mounted in the wing roots and one MG-15 mounted in the dorsal position and another in the rear cone. It could also carry four 110-pound bombs under the wings. The FW-189 first flew in 1938 and won the design competition. It remained in production until 1944 and almost 900 of them were built in the end. Operational History The 189 had several nicknames. The German army called it the Fliegende Auge, or Flying Eye. The Soviets called it the Rama, which means frame in Russian, and describes its open, angular look from the ground. My favorite name is Uhu, which is named for a species of bird called the Eagle Owl. It makes sense because this is an observation aircraft and, you know, think of the big eyes of an owl, right? I also like that the name of the bird actually sounds like the call of the owl. Ooh-hoo. Don't get confused with the night-fighting Henkel HE-219, which was also called the Uhu. The 189 was the flying eyes of the German army in the field. Although it certainly doesn't look that tough, supposedly it was and proved to be very reliable. Its undercarriage was built tough, with the knowledge that it would be using improvised airstrips close to the front lines. 
the wings and underside of the aircraft were armored and very sturdy. There are tales of this thing coming back with most of a tail boom shot away. There were several variants of the FW-189. As usual, for service in North Africa, there was a tropical model with filters over the air intakes to prevent sand and dust from clogging its engines. The A-2 model upgunned the defenses to the faster-firing MG-81s. There were trainer versions with five seats. Not simply content to observe and report, one Eagle Owl version had sharpened claws in the guise of two 20mm autocannons placed in its wing roots for ground attack and was given extra armor protection for its engines, undersides, and fuel tanks. Near the end of the war, some were even modified for the night fighter role, having their reconnaissance equipment pulled out and airborne interception radar installed in the nose. Back in the rear compartment, a single obliquely firing 20mm autocannon, Schraga Music, was fitted. When the Soviets liked a plane, they were known to copy it. And their version of the Uhu was the Su-12. Pilots and Survivors On the 14th of May 1943, at an airstrip on the edge of the Arctic Circle near the Finnish-Russian border, Uhu V-7-1H prepared for a photo recon mission with a crew of three on board. Lothar Mothes was the pilot, and with him were two observer gunners. At about three in the morning, Mothes pushed the throttles of their FW-189 forward, and they took off. Their mission was to photograph the Luki-3 airbase from 20,000 feet. About 30 minutes into the flight, they were jumped by Russian Hawker Hurricanes. In the air-to-air -air combat, both gunners were wounded and Mothes made a forced landing in the forest. He survived the crash, although his gunners did not. Mothes hid and evaded behind Russian lines for two weeks, living off grubs he found behind bark on trees. Eventually, he was spotted and rescued. He spent nine months in the hospital, but made a full recovery and returned to his duties as a pilot, flying a further 100 missions in FW-189s. He survived the war and worked as an architect in Germany. The wreck lay undisturbed for half a century until retrieved by helicopter. During an air show in the UK in 1996, Malthus was invited to be reunited with his aircraft some 53 years since he had left it. Reportedly, he walked up to the cockpit, placed his hands on the throttles, saying, just where I left them. The aircraft is presently at the Aircraft Restoration Company at Duxford and is now at an advanced stage of restoration. At some point it will be for sale and the future owners will have to choose whether to keep the aircraft in a static condition or even to return it to flying. In closing, the 189 wasn't fast, or powerful, or particularly deadly, or even beautiful. But we have to admit that it did exactly what it was designed to do, and it did it well. Its crews liked it, and even its enemies respected and appreciated it. As the Celtic Thunder Song says, all God's creatures got a place in the choir. And that includes the Uhu. Hey viewers, do you prefer videos about more obscure aircraft like this one? Or do you like the stars of the conflict, like the Mustangs and Spitfires? If you like the obscure weirdos, vote with the Super Thanks button and I'll know where to focus. If you like to listen as well as watch, you could check out my audio podcast on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. You can purchase Warbird t-shirts, toys, models, and all kinds of other stuff at the World of Warbirds kit shop. Christmas is coming. Until next time.